Good morning, Generation Church. How are you doing today? It is my honor to share week two with you of the series, Mad at God. And uh, I really hope that God is speaking to you through this series. I know for me, I have personally um, been checked in my anger this week after listening to uh, Pastor Ben's message last week. It wasn't, it, not so much that I'm currently in a place where I'm mad at God, but man, I get mad at people. And people have been trying me. People have been testing me. I was at a stoplight yesterday, and I was turning right, and you know how you're supposed to yield to the U-turn, and all these people were U-turning, and the person behind me honked at me. I was like, don't honk at me, I can't, I can't go right now. And I wanted to be angry, but I decided that I was going to check my anger and, uh, and, and not let it turn into something that I didn't want, right? So hopefully this series is helping you out. It's doing something good for you. And um, I know that it is for me. So I'm going to jump in today with a question and a statement. My question for you is, are you mad at God? And the statement is, even if you are, he's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. You know, I think it's worth noting that, that emotion, that anger, that joy, that, that happiness, sadness, and everything in between is, is, is not a bad thing. This series is not about trying to eliminate or eradicate anger for, from your life permanently. It's about hopefully helping each and every one of us to know what to do when we, um, when we experience anger. The scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, be angry. It's okay. Be angry. But do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't harbor it. Don't, don't become a safe place for the seeds of anger um, where it begins to grow and go unchecked. Because we know that, that unchecked anger um, takes us places that we don't want to go. Last week, Pastor Ben talked about the times that we get mad at God. And Oftentimes, we get mad at God when uh, something happens that we did not expect. We're shocked by something. We're surprised. We're overwhelmed. We're, 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 we're taken by surprise by something that we never saw coming. Or we expected something to happen that didn't. We, we, we were counting on it. We were certain that this was going to be the outcome. I did all the right things. I checked all the boxes. I've, I've done my part, so certainly the outcome should go my way. Or there are free will agents in a broken world, and sometimes we're hurt by people. So today, the goal of this series is to open a dialogue, offer some constructive thoughts and some theology, get you thinking, and hopefully offer some personal growth steps in getting past anger. So how do you know if you're mad at God? You know, you might be sitting there today asking yourself, like, I don't know, am I? Maybe I am mad at God and I don't even know it. Well, I'm glad you said that because I've put together a quiz. Just a little quiz, you didn't have to study, you didn't have to prepare, but just some questions to ask to help us locate ourselves and determine if perhaps we might be mad at God. Here we go, are you guys ready? Are you sure? Question number one, have you had some negative experiences where God could have intervened but seemingly did not? Are you still dealing with the pain? the consequences, or the negative memory of that experience. Number three, do you avoid that topic or situation when it comes to your prayer life? Like are there places with God, prayer time, you just, you won't go there, you won't discuss it. Or possibly, maybe the opposite direction, maybe your prayer life is filled with only asking why. God, why? Why did this happen? Why did you let that happen? How could you? Why? Number five, have you determined that God is good in some cases, but not all? And lastly, do you get angry when others speak about God positively? Some questions to ask yourself to determine if you may, in fact, be mad at God. 
So, are you mad at God? Well, he's not mad at you. And I've found that it's hard to be mad at someone who's not mad at you. Like, have you ever been there before where, where you've built up a narrative in your head that you're angry at someone and, um, and you actually begin to believe that they're angry at you too? Like, and, and that you have this conflict going on, you have this drama going on, you have something going on that isn't even real. It doesn't even exist. Or have you ever been mad at someone or simply disliked somebody that you didn't know that well? So think about like a situation where like a friend tells you something about someone that is negative. And you don't know that person, you don't, you don't know anything about them, but, but you, just, you just have that thing that, that somebody shared with you and it sort of stained the way you view that other individual. Anybody? Just me? Okay. I imagine you might be thinking of two or three or four people like, and then, and then you, maybe a situation happens or you run into that person or you're sort of forced to have a conversation with them and then you find out they're nothing like you thought. Nothing like you thought. In today's message, I hope to accomplish three things. Number one, I hope to, to illustrate who God is and what his intentions are toward humanity. Because maybe some of us, we don't know God as well as we think we do. Like somebody told us something negative about him once, and, um, and, and so because of that, we sort of had the skewed viewpoint of who he really is. But my hope today is that you walk away knowing more of God's intention toward you. Number two, I hope that we're going to explore a common response to anger. Something that I would say probably 99% of us in the room share as it relates to moments when we get angry. And number three, I hope to offer an alternative to that common response, a, a different way, um, a, a solution that, that, that might help us overcome some of the anger that we experience. So what are God's intentions for humanity? Who is he really? You know, God is vast, he is big, he is, the Bible says that his ways are past finding out, like he is, he is this amazing God that created the universe, and, and, and I know for me, sometimes I just feel like, God, like you're an enigma, I can't really understand you, I can't really wrap my mind around you, but, but, but I want to know who you are. And maybe you, like me, wish that there was like this Cliff Notes version of who God is. And sometimes we think that God is so mysterious that he's hiding who he is from us. Anybody ever felt like that before? Like he's hiding, like I, I can't seem to, to nail him down. I can't really understand what he's doing in my life. And, 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 and worse, I, I'm not even sure how he really feels about me. Maybe he's mad at me. Well, God cares about you so much, he loves you so much, and he is not mad at you, and, and, and he wants to communicate that in, in several places in scripture. There's this place in scripture where the summation of who God is, the cliff notes, if you will, of why he came, the reason that he wants to be involved in your life, and how he feels about you, um, it, it, it's all found in this one little place. And so if you ever find yourself in that moment where you feel like God is distant, he's mysterious, he's hard to pin down, I don't know who he is, he's for other people, but he's not for me. You too can go to this one place in scripture. And it's found in I, Isaiah 61. This book is written by a prophet whose name is Isaiah. Isaiah. And he's telling about God's intention for humanity. What the point of a Messiah is, the point of a Christ, the point of Jesus, like, like the whole reason why he's here, what he wants to do, and, uh, and, and you know, whether or not we, he can be trusted. So let's read it together, Isaiah 61.1. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. 
And for many of you, that's a very familiar scripture, but for those of you to whom that is unfamiliar, I'm gonna hopefully break it down in a way that we can all understand and get on the same page. Because this is God's attempt to reach you, to communicate to you who he really is. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. All right, let's break that down for a second. The spirit of God is the essence of God. It is the fullness of his character. It is, it is all that he is summed up in, 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 in just one package that, that, that here he is, God, the spirit. You have a spirit about you. You have a spirit in you, but, but people are like, oh, she's a really nice person, or she's a really funny person, or he's kind of, you know, he's kind of like mean and rude and whatever, and, um, but you have a spirit about you. God has a spirit. It's the essence of who he is. So the spirit of God is upon Jesus. That's who it's talking about. Because he has anointed him, what does that mean? That means he has empowered him that he has everything that it takes to do what he says he's about to do. So here's the character of God on one side of the equation and the power of God to do it on the other side of the equation. So what's he gonna do? Well, preach good news to the poor. Bring good news to the poor. And you might be sitting here today and you're like, wow, Melissa, that's, that's awesome. You know, I'm really glad that God cares about homeless people. But that's not me. You know, I'm not really poor uh, by society standards, and so I'm, I'm really glad that God has outreach programs for poor people. But that's not what the scripture's talking about. The scripture is talking about the point of your need. Because regardless of where you fall in the socioeconomic, socioeconomic strata of our world, you have something that you cannot fix on your own. And the scripture is telling us that at the point of your need, at the moment of your pain, at, at, at the time when you're, you're, you're sitting in, in your overwhelm and your confusion and your difficulty, he is bringing good news to you. That's what he does. That's why he exists. That's why he came. That is the spirit of God along with the power of God involving himself in your life to bring you encouragement at the moment of your discouragement. That's who he is. If you ever wondered who God is, if you ever wondered if, if his intentions are, are, are bad toward you, if you ever wondered if he's actually mad at you for the poor decisions you've made, if, you, if, you've, if you've ever wondered about God, that right there is who he is. He says he wants to bind up your broken heart. You know, a lot of my broken heartedness in life has come through my poor choices. It's also come through uh, things that I didn't see coming or I didn't expect. But either way, he doesn't make the distinction. He doesn't say that he's only present to bind up my broken heart for the things that I didn't do to myself. He says he's there regardless. It doesn't matter. The brokenness is what matters to him. It says that he came to set at liberty the captives and the opening of the prison door to those who are bound. What I love about that statement is that uh, it's twofold. It's same, same concept, same vein, same, same topic, but it's twofold. He says, he says I'm, I'm coming to talk to you about the freedom that you need. Because maybe today you're in some kind of prison. You're in a prison of shame, you're in a prison of addiction, you're in a prison of, of, of bad choices or bad relationships, or you're in a prison of some kind. And I wanna to talk to you about the freedom that is available to you. And not only that, I wanna show you the door. See, if you've ever wondered about who God is or what he came to do or, or how he wants to involve himself in your life, this is it. It's hard to be mad at someone who's not mad at you. But oftentimes we what we know about God is just hearsay. It's what we think about him. And, and I hope today that through going through Isaiah 61, just the first scripture, um, not to mention the rest of the scriptures in that chapter that speak about the good things that he wants to do in your life, hopefully it closes the, the gap between what you know about him and who he really is. 
who he really is. This passage is especially meaningful to me. And you don't, yet, you don't yet know it, but it's especially meaningful to you as well. Because every single week, without fail, I pray this over you and your family. That every person who comes in the, in the doors here at Generation Church, man, woman, child, that they would experience the God of Isaiah 61. That regardless of whether you're mad at God, you're indifferent to God, you love God, you do all the right things, you do all the wrong things, regardless that you would experience the hope, the freedom, the liberty, the, 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 the joy that he wants to offer you. And I want to invite you to join me in praying that prayer. That every single weekend when people come in the doors here, every single week when people go out of the doors to their homes, that the God of Isaiah 61, the promises that he gives to us would be real in their lives. And that we would be a church that knows who God really is. And we live lives that demonstrate the hope of who God really is. And that our community sees a church living out the gospel of who God really is. The big idea from this passage is that if you've ever wondered God's purpose in coming to earth, why all the trouble to send his son and he lives for 33 years and then he dies on a cross and then he raises, it, why all the trouble? If you read through Isaiah 61, it's, it's your pain. Your individual, personal pain. That's his purpose. That's his whole reason for coming. It's hard to be mad at a God that's not mad at you. You know, the thing about this passage that we do have to reconcile is we have to recognize that even though God is so good and even though he is present with us in difficulty, bad things do happen. We experience harm. We experience things we didn't expect. We, 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 things go really, really good sometimes, and then suddenly things go sideways. And when we're angry and we're at the point of reaction when things are going sideways, um, the good news is that God is right there with us. But you see, when things are going sideways in our lives, we have a very limited view of what's happening. What makes God God is that he has the unlimited view. He sees more than we do. He knows more than we do. And oftentimes, many of us, uh, um, in our anger, in our frustration, in the difficulty of our limited viewpoint, um, we begin to try to make decisions. We begin to try to take control. We begin to try to do something different in order to avoid the pain that we're experiencing. So like as an example, you got married, it was going really good for a while, and then all of a sudden, man, you just wish you could be single again. Things went sideways. You had kids and you're like, this is gonna be amazing. I'm doing every single Pinterest thing that ever was. I am the Instagram queen where our, my children's birthdays are gonna be perfect, and really all you wanna do is like take a nap. Can I get an amen, mamas? You started a business. This is going to be awesome. I'm, I'm pumped up. We're taking over the world. We've got our 10-year vision. We're going to go regional in like 12 months. You know, all that. You're ready. And then making that one sale is so much harder than you thought. And in that limited viewpoint, we start looking for outs. We start looking for ways around what God has called us to do, the commitments we've made. We start looking for an out. And sometimes we get angry at God. I've been angry at God. Many of you may not know this, but prior to starting Generation Church, Ben and I both had very successful corporate careers. And uh, we felt this calling to begin this church. We're also very, even today, still highly entrepreneurial. We enjoy a variety of projects. We like achieving. We like, we like making things happen. We just, we love working together. And so, so you know, we decide that we, God is calling us to start this church, and it's going to be amazing, and it's going to be the best thing ever. And, and, and honestly, guys, I feel like it is. So, yeah. But... 
it hasn't been without its difficulty. You know, we've hit some hard places in the road at different points. And, uh, you know, a few years in, um, things are going great. And then, then we, we hit some bumps. And as we hit those bumps, we, um, you know, we get a little bit like, like jarred a little bit. And we're trying to sort of figure out which way is up. And, 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 and through that, there's like confusion and overwhelm. And, and then for me, I, I, I know that I start like trying to like do all the right things and check all the right boxes and have all the right conversations. And, I found myself angry, and I found myself looking for an out. Because you see, success, it wasn't that far behind me. It would have been easy to reach back. And new opportunities, things that friends were doing, things I could partner on, um, projects that I could get involved in, businesses I could invest in, that wasn't too far in front of me. And I was in so much pain. I was in... So much just turmoil around the disappointment that I had of how th I thought things were going to go. I just wanted to get out. And the more I tried, the more nothing changed. And the more nothing changed, the more powerless I felt. And in that powerlessness, I just, I, I, I just became so angry at God and asking the question, why? Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe in life right now, you just want to run away. I want to put a footnote in there that I actually never wanted to run away from Ben Pierce. Um, he's never leaving. I'm never leaving. If I'm going anywhere, it's with him. But from vocational ministry, I was like, man, this is not what I thought. And I am thankful that I met the God of Isaiah 61 who reminded me that his intentions toward me are good regardless of, of what was happening and how good I thought things were. He was there. If you identify with my story and you uh, too have been in a place where you really want to run away, um, there are many figures in the Bible who have experienced the same thing. You know, Peter... The Apostle Peter is one of those figures. Peter uh, started out with Jesus. He had a business, and in Matthew 4, 19, let's read it together. He was a fisherman, successful, got his business going. And in Matthew 4, 19, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Immediately. They said, okay, this business, we're closing up shop. We're going to, dad, you take over. We're going to follow this guy, Jesus. And they're just like, wow, like you. This new job, this marriage, these kids, this thing that I'm starting, it's amazing. Jesus is doing miracles. This is so much better than going to the dock every day. Jesus is feeding thousands of people. People are getting healed. Jesus has all this drama going on with like the rulers and the religious people of the day. And like, we're just sort of in this thing. And he says he's going to be a king. And, um, and, and we're going to be his subjects because, you know, we're his boys. And we've just been hanging out with him for the past couple of years. And, and then all of a sudden, things begin to go sideways. They go sideways for Peter. And it's hard for us to identify with that because for millennia, we, we've been looking at the artwork, The Last Supper. We know it is The Last Supper. But Peter and the disciples, they didn't know that it was The Last Supper. They just thought they were at dinner with Jesus. They just thought that they were living their life, doing their thing, um, having dinner with Jesus, and then all of a sudden, things start to get out of control get mad at God. So they're at the Last Supper, and Jesus is like, hey, look, guys, um, somebody's going to betray me. And they're like, what? Jesus, are you crazy? Is it me? Is it I? It's like, yeah. They're like, okay. All right, Jesus. And then that night, they go into this garden, and Jesus is deeply distressed. He's deeply distressed. 
He's sweating blood and he keeps asking them to pray with him and pray for him. And they're like, okay, yeah, Jesus, we're going to, oh, God, please help Jesus. And they fall back to sleep. They don't know the moment they're in. They don't understand what is happening right now. And then Jesus gets arrested. And once Jesus gets arrested, Peter thinks that it's his job to defend Jesus. He cuts off the ear of the guy who's, uh, of, who got, of the guy who's arresting Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, 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 let's not do that. And he actually heals the guy's ear. And maybe like you, Peter, um, maybe, maybe like Peter, you've been in some situations where you think that you have a circumspect viewpoint. You think you can see it all. You think you can experience, you're, you, you're experiencing it all. You think you have the right perspective on exactly what's happening. But like Peter, you don't. That's why we need the God of Isaiah 61. And instead of recognizing our need for him, we actually sometimes get mad at him. So then the ultimate thing happens and Jesus dies. Like, he gets arrested, and at the point of his arrest, all the disciples, like, the scripture tells us that they forsook him and fled. And I am sure that each one of them on their own are like, it wasn't supposed to be this way. We were just eating dinner last night. We were just hanging out. Like, what is going on? Like, they always, the, the, the rulers, the, 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 the leaders of the day, they were always speaking against Jesus, but they were never able to do anything with him. Like, like we weren't prepared for this. So Jesus dies, and very few of the disciples are actually present at his death. Confused, angry, overwhelmed. Every single one of them had to be asking the question, what am I going to do now? I need an out. I need, I need something else. I need something different. I've got I've to change direction so, so that I can preserve myself, so I can preserve my life or at least what's left of it. So Jesus raises from the dead. He appears to the disciples, including Peter, at least two times. But there's all this unresolved communication going on. They've seen Jesus, like the risen Christ, at least two times. And we pick up in John chapter 21, where after Jesus has died, there, P Peter makes the declaration. He, he puts the period at the end of the Jesus sentence, and he actually says, I'm going fishing. Like this three years, like I, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to take my out and I'm going to go. The scripture actually says this in John chapter 21, verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, the other disciples, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Historians actually believe, they state that, that they were going back to their secular occupation. They, they put a period at the end of the sentence. They said, this is over. I'm changing direction. They're trying to take control. They knew the promises of God. You see, they were there on the day in Luke chapter 4 in the temple where Jesus took the scroll that was Isaiah's scroll and read the same passage that we just talked about. But Jesus added another line and he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying that all the good things that I intend toward humanity, all the hope, the liberty, the freedom, the encouragement, all of that today, now that Jesus is here, now that he is present, it's fulfilled. You can experience it. Those guys, they heard all of those promises and they still tried to take control of their lives and look for a way out. But at the moment when they were looking for a way out, Jesus shows up. These guys have left their commitment to following him. They're confused about whether or not he's risen and things have just gotten all messed up and they don't know what to do next. And all of a sudden, the sun is rising and they look to the shore and there's Jesus on the beach. 
And the very first thing that Jesus says to them is this. He says, children, do you have any food? And that might seem like a kind of obscure question or maybe a very Jesus-y thing to say, but, but if you think about um, the discourse in, in regular conversation and relationship, that, that, that's not really how people treat people. When you're mad at someone and like Jesus, Jesus knew everything that the disciples and Peter did. See, he knew that Peter denied him. He, of course, told Peter that he would, but, but, but still, like, we, as people, like, I, have fe- I would have feelings about that. I would have a litany of offenses against Peter. You know, I would think that Jesus' first question might be like, come on, guys, three years, seeing all these miracles, doing all these things, and this is how you repay me? You go back fishing? Or like, you know what, Peter? We haven't yet had a conversation about how you, the scripture says that you cursed and you swore and you were vehemently angry in your denial. You know what else, guys? Like, nobody was at my funeral. Thanks a lot. But his first question lines up with the God of Isaiah 61. Because the God of Isaiah 61, when you really get to know him, he does not hold your offenses against you. If he did, then that's all the things that the scripture would tell us he probably said. But I think many of us are mad at God because we think he's mad at us. We think that he really is sort of holding on to some offenses of things we've done. Maybe things we promised, things we vowed, things that we said we would never do again and then we did it. We think he's holding on to that and so because we think he's mad at us, we're, we're like slightly mad at him. But he's the God that shows up and he asks the question, do you have any food? Do you have the thing that you need right now? Are you all good? How can I help? That's what he's asking the disciples, and today that's what he's asking you. He wasn't offended that they changed direction. He wasn't offended that they tried to take control of their own lives. He wasn't mad that they went back to fishing and tried to restart their business. He just cared about them. You see, we think that our safety is in the control we take. That if I can just grab control, if I can grab the wheel, if I can, if I can begin to steer my life in the direction I think it, it should go, then I'll be safe. But your safety is actually found in surrender. Surrendering to the God of Isaiah 61 who cares so deeply about you. And recognizing that it's hard to be mad at a God that's not actually mad at you. Today, you might be in a place in life, some, some area of your life where you just want to give up. Or maybe you've been there in the past. Maybe you'll be there in the future. I just can't take it anymore. I've got to move on. I've got to go back. I've got to do something. But it's, I've got to get out of this. God wants to present a third option to you today. And that is to be still. Be still. The scripture tells us in Psalm 4610 to be still and to know that he is God. And you might be sitting there saying, Melissa, be still, be still. I've been still. I've been patient. I've tried. I've done all the things I know how to do and it's still not changing. You want me to be still. I don't want you to be still and do nothing. I want you to be still and know. Know that he is good and that he is God. That he's good when people are not. He's good when things don't turn out the way we expected them to. He's good when our heart is broken. He's good when we're confused. He's good when we don't know why. He is good all the time. (laughs) 
in your running, in, in your looking, in your searching, in your seeking to avoid the pain that you're experiencing. What you're really looking for is the goodness of God. You have to believe that he's good. And in your stillness, you'll find his goodness.